Howdy YouTube and welcome to this episode of The Gunman. So this video here, I'm going to be taking you guys through the primer work on this VESV6 Holden Commodore. The name of the colour on this car is Parisian Steel and the colour code is 102X. So as you can see, we've just got a small repair on that dog leg. We're also going to be blending the rear door. I've got footage of this entire job from start to finish, except for the remove and refit and also the repair stage. That's because the guys from next door, the panel vetters, they do that side of it. But as far as the paintwork goes, I do have footage of this entire job. I may get around to editing up the rest of it at a later date, but this one will just be focusing on the primer work. So obviously you've noticed I put a little bit of tape down the bottom where that sill cover meets the quarter panel just so I don't hit it when I'm doing the prep work now when you're doing this you probably should uh, put a piece of paper over that door opening so you don't get too much dust inside the owner's car on this occasion I decided not to there's really only two tiny little bits I needed to give a very quick sand I then got the airline straight away blew all that dust out of the car but if it had been much of a bigger area that I needed to sand or, or, or I had more sanding to do I probably would have uh, got a piece of paper to cover it up and stop most of that uh, dust from getting inside the car. Obviously next up, gave it a blow off and then I've got a 400 grit softback sanding sponge just to go around the edges. I was using 320 grit on the orbital sander, that's what you saw me do just a minute ago. Now you could replace that sort of anywhere between 400 to 240. I wouldn't recommend going much coarser than 240 because you're just going to end up ripping into that uh, factory paint and you don't really want that. So, so sometimes keeping it that little bit finer is uh, best off. So also with that sanding sponge that you saw me use, you could replace that with a piece of red scotch bright for primer work and that's totally fine. But either way, it doesn't really matter. There's many, uh, more than one way to skin a cat and uh, whatever works for you, whatever you're happy with doing. So next up, you obviously see me cleaning up behind that wheel arch. That way that when I go to mask it, my tape's going to stick. It's not uncommon for lots and lots of mud to be sitting up under those wheel arches and uh, I like to have my tape sticking when I do the masking stage. There's nothing more irritating than doing your back masking then when you go to put your paper or plastic over the top of it it just starts peeling off and it's annoying i do prefer to properly back mask all wheel arches back in the day i used to always just throw a bag over the wheel or throw a piece of paper over the wheel overspray lands up under there these days i prefer not to do it a couple of reasons it'll actually keep your job cleaner less chance of stuff from underneath that wheel arch flowing back into your paint and then you don't have overspray underneath that wheel as well that you've got to get the black gun out and uh, tidy up later later on when their job's getting detailed or anything like that so works best off if you do back mask your wheel arches as you see me doing there I'm using the Tiger tape this is a yellow tape it's pretty good tape I mean it's not one of the best I've used to be honest um, it does the job but as soon as it's cold like you can leave that tape on for five minutes peel it off and it'll leave that residue behind Apart from that, it's not a big deal. Uh, when unmasking in the booth, I like to make sure it's uh, still nice and warm when I am doing the unmasking stage. How good's that masking machine? No, it's totally awesome. Just so handy, I can just walk up to a job. I don't only have my sandpapers, my scotch brights, all that. I've got my cleaning solvents. I've also got the masking machine and everything I need to do that job. It's at arm's reach and I don't have to walk around the workshop looking for things as I'm working on a car. And that's uh, pretty important when you're trying to do numbers or trying to do as much work as you can. Another thing that has had a few mentions in the last couple of months, I've done a raw video where I was using these Colad uh, blades. These are really actually awesome. What happened is we ran out of uh, standard razor blades. I was forced to use these uh, Colad blades, which a couple of years ago I used a similar type. Never liked it, I hated it. I just thought, no, nope, normal razor blades have been using them for so long, they're heaps better, but after getting used to these things, after a couple of days, I'm like, you know what, they're better, and I personally wouldn't go back to standard razor blades. They'll probably actually work out cheaper. One of these actually lasts for quite some time. I think I've got a box of maybe 10 of them and been using them for over three months already, and yeah, I've still got four or five brand new ones sitting there. So um, it will work out cheaper than grabbing a new razor blade every time. They do stay sharp for a lot longer and you can also put them in your pocket without running the risk of putting your hand in your pocket and uh, slicing your fingers, which I did once when I was an apprentice 
And ever since then, I don't put standard razor blades in my pocket, but it's handy to have one of these in your pocket. So no matter where you are, what you're doing, uh, again, like I was saying before, you're always e equipped, you know, you're not like, oh, in the booth and then you've got to run back to the paint room to grab another razor blade. So it, it's those, you know, little 20, 30 seconds uh, that to me adds up to the possibility of either getting that next job painted at the end of the day or not having enough time and having to come in in the morning. And um, yeah, that those kind of little things do add up. And yeah, to a boss, when they see you're getting uh, a lot of work done. And when you want to go for a pay rise, you can say, hey, look, I absolutely pump the work out. I do it a good, good quality work. Um, well, they're going to be happy to give you uh, decent money, you know. So that's what this trade is all about at the end of the day. It's all about money. Um, I'm no different than anyone else. I'm out there to make money in this trade. I do enjoy it. So that's a bonus for me that I do actually enjoy it. It's more than just work, you know. I, I've got a passion for it. But at the end of the day, I'm there to make money and pay my bills and get ahead in life. I don't really want to be doing this when I'm 60 years old. And if I am doing it, I'll be doing it more so for pleasure than to yeah, be working my ass off like I am these days. I might sort of slow down later in life focus on some restoration work or some custom projects and stuff like that. Not so much having to pump the work out. So when I'm young, make hay while the sun shines, as they say. So what I'm doing here is putting some paper around those areas of the masking. That's mainly because I'm using these heat lights. So if you get these heat lights too close to a panel uh, and there's plastic on it, you can actually melt that plastic, whereas paper is a better insulator. So now I'm going to mix up my primer and I'm using the Chromax range. So we've actually actually got the software on the computer. I can just type in the specific value shade that I wanted. From memory, it was value shade number five on this one that I used, and then able to measure it out and put the amount in that I like on the computer. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing that unless you either know the specific weights that they're meant to be, or you have the correct software on your computer that will tell you exactly how much to put in, uh, because you might think, uh, okay, so that's 10 to 1. So I'll just go 100 grams of the primer and then uh, 10 grams of the hardener. Uh, it's not the case because the mixing ratios are always by volume, not by weight. So 100 mils of primer doesn't necessarily weigh 100 grams because there's a higher solid content in there. So it's uh, obviously that's mainly because it's thicker. So yeah, just make sure you get those mixing ratios right and you're best off using a stick and a pot or a calibrated pot rather than weighing it up. Unless, as I say, you do know specifically how much uh, weight it is meant to be. So for instance, we've got this wash primer and on the back of that can I read the back of it and it says 39 grams of reducer to every 100 grams of primer or 2 to 1 so as I say 2 to 1 isn't necessarily 2 to 1 by weight it's 2 to 1 by volume because they will all weigh different uh, amounts so hope you followed that I may actually do a specific video on how to mix up uh, paints because I've had a few questions about it recently. It's gonna be a fairly, like for beginners type video, something that I would imagine most of my viewers would already have the, the grasp of how to mix paints up, but yeah, there may be a few people that can benefit from it, so I'm happy to make a video like that. Um, so yeah, you notice that I did pre-warm that panel. Don't wanna get it too hot. I've actually done it before and uh, haven't cooled it down enough in between coats, and it just starts crinkling up and looking all nasty. So what you see me doing here, I'm uh, just feeling that panel, seeing if it's still warm. I'm just blowing a bit of air over the top of that primer just to cool that panel down a bit quicker. I wouldn't blow air over a fresh two-pack primer like straight after I put it down. You want it to eggshell over because you could possibly sort of move that primer and have it start uh, looking all funny. So yeah, put your coat on put the lights on for five or so minutes, come back, cool it back down, put your next coat on. So for this job, I ended up putting uh, four coats on, obviously removing the flash off times because that would just about be as boring as watching paint dry. You may have also noticed that there was already a little bit of primer over that repaired area. So the panel beater has gone and done his filler repair. He's then put a couple of coats or one coat of an etch primer just out of an aerosol can. And that was just to sort of fill up any of his scratches and also seal down that metal so you're going to get adhesion to the metal if there was any bare metal there i would have got some wash primer that primer i was referring to earlier and put a bit of that over it something that over the years uh, i have and haven't done um, it's best that you do do it 
but on a small area, something the size of this repair, it probably would have been okay without it. But those wash primers and etch primers, they will actually have a little bit of uh, corrosion protection as well. So you really are best off if you do use them. So decided to include a little bit of footage of me cleaning out my awesome PRI Pro Light Primer Gun. It's got a 1.8 mil uh, fluid tip on it. I've actually got a specific review and demo on this gun. And uh, yeah, it's a totally awesome gun, as you can tell. There's many uh, other guns on the market, many other different primer guns, but this primer gun here is definitely the best primer gun I've ever owned, and I would imagine it's gonna be in my arsenal for quite some time. I just thought I'd let you guys know quickly that I've actually quit this job, and I've moved back to the place where my videos all started. So you guys uh, who have been viewing my videos for quite some time may remember the shop where I was using Standox solvent in. I've decided to move back there. A few reasons for it. I'll go through that in some other videos. This is a quick look at the car as it rolled out of the spray booth. Stay tuned for more videos. Now you've seen this video, get out there and paint some shit. Thanks for watching. Gunman out.